Good evening, Bahamas, on the broadcast tonight. One of the country's most wanted murder suspects is captured. Plus, the opposition accuses the governing free national movement of victimizing members of the public service. And find out the perfect workout just in time to get that summer body. is brought to you by Alive, the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. Welcome to our news, the weekend edition, and thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Knowles. Topping the news, a massive overnight island-wide operation on New Providence by police has resulted in the capture of a most wanted murder suspect. Police say 45-year-old Ronald Nottage, who was wanted for questioning in connection with the stabbing death of 55-year-old Valderis Bolek last week Wednesday, was arrested without incident in an area in southern New Providence. Police have described Nottage as a prolific offender who was recently released from prison after serving a year's sentence for being convicted of attempting to strangle his ex-girlfriend, the same woman who was stabbed to death last week. His arrest comes just a day after senior police issued wanted posters for eight murder suspects. Among them are Dwight Morrison, a.k.a. Kitty, 33-year-old Patrick Goff of Washington Street, and although he has dreadlocks on his wanted poster, police say they have learned he has since cut them. Also wanted is 28-year-old Alfred George of Knowles Drive, 30-year-old Jermaine Scott of Golden Gates, and 18-year-old Julio DeVoe of Morley Street, 25-year-old Gibson Baptiste of Golden Isles Road, and 31-year-old Tico Lightburn of McCartney Lane and Wilson Tract, have also managed to evade police. Now, during Friday's press conference, Senior Assistant Commissioner of Police Stephen Dean pledged that officers would track down these suspects whether they were in the Bahamas or left the country. He also issued a stern warning to the public not to harbor any of the suspects. Well, also from last night's operation, two women were arrested after a search on their home in South Beach allegedly uncovered a Smith & Wesson handgun and seven rounds of ammunition, along with a quantity of marijuana. Meantime, 28 other people were taken into custody, reportedly for armed robbery, dangerous drugs, stealing, outstanding warrants, and breach of the Immigration Act. Three nightclubs were closed down, reportedly for breach of Business and Liquor Licenses Act. Additionally, 205 drivers were ticketed for various infra traffic infractions. In other news this evening, leader of the opposition, Philip Davis, says it is clearly not the people's time, as promised by the governing free national movement. Davis says he bases his claim on the fact that there has been what he called widespread victimization in the public service sector since the FNM took office. Jasmine Brown reports. Davis insists the FNM government has demonstrated the exact opposite of what the party promised in the weeks leading up to the May 10th general election. He says it's clear the slogan, it's the people's time, was clearly empty rhetoric. They say it's the people's time. And I want to know when it will be the people's time. There are a few, there are a few days and weeks in office that's not demonstrated to me that it is the people's time. Davis has repeatedly blasted the Minnesota administration for what he called its unfair handling of workers in the public service. Days after the election, he questioned the treatment of nine members of staff at the Bahamas Agricultural and Industrial Corporation, including chairman of the corporation and former Deputy House Speaker Dion Smith. The group was questioned by police over alleged theft at the property on election night, but no charges have ever been filed in the case. And just two weeks ago, Davis accused the Minnesota administration of rank victimization, discrimination and intimidation after their decision to place several National Insurance Board executives on involuntary leave, saying he condemned this action against the board's employees. Relieving people of their jobs. Um, I mean, people, when people are working, it means there's something for them to do. Right? And, and why would you want to stop that person from doing what they have to do? And so if you're going to let them go and then bring somebody else in, um, and it, it, it's not a good precedent to be set. Um, I can tell you, um, we uh, attempted to 
to embrace everyone that we met on the job when we came in in 2012. And, and um, not this, this apparent wholesale witch hunting um, will have to stop. Davis adds that even the 2017-2018 budget proves the f and is looking out for a certain sector of society and not all Bahamians. It is clear, particularly in reviewing this budget, there's only a certain group of people, certain segments of people that they are, seem to be interested in. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Increasing airlift and improving airports across the country is at the top of the Ministry of Tourism's priorities. That's according to Tourism Minister Dionisio Diagola. The Tourism Minister says with the multi-billion dollar Bahama project coming on stream, they will need people to fill those hundreds of rooms on the Cable Beach Strip. Diagola says he has already been in talks with airlines that provide airlift to the Bahamas and they have assured him they are ready to meet any demand. Obviously, as Bahama expands the amount of inventory or rooms that they have, all of the airlines have assured me that they will review the situation and as demand increases, they are happy to add additional lift. In addition to getting additional flights, the tourism minister says airports across the country are in desperate need of updating, refurbishing and expanding. But he says it's not something the government can do alone. We have a goal which is to grow the amount of visitors to our country, to grow the average room rate that they have. While Tourism Minister Dionisio Diagla expressed concern over a 25% occupancy level at the Mega Bahama Resort due to what he called a premature opening, Chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, Gowan Bo, says that there, there needs to be a deeper level of questioning in that low occupancy figure as it may not be as bad as it seems. I think as it relates to occupancy levels, we have to be very careful about that being what I would call an astonishing figure. Uh, the first aspect is, is that 25% of the entire property, knowing that we only had one of the properties actually opened and it's a phase opening. So is that 25% of total room inventory or 25% of the existing uh, open room inventory, which is a very uh, big distinction. Bahamar's senior vice president of government and external affairs, Robert Sands, told the media recently that of the 1,800 rooms in the Grand Hyatt Hotel, all are licensed for occupancy and, quote, a significant amount are open. Bo says there should not be an alarm in the number, but first have an understanding whether or not the low occupancy is a part of the plan, as it was indicated from the previous administration there that there would be a phased opening of the hotel once opened. I believe when we sit down, uh, as opposed to sensationalizing a number, it is more understanding the, the parameters that go into it. And so if this is in line with their plan, then it is very clear that they have, if you will, uh, mechanisms in place to address that, whether it be from the funding perspective, whether it be about how they maintain the property and move forward. And so if this was their projected plan for a phased opening, then the owners are perceived to have the competency to do so, and they would know how to run a successful operation. We'll also address the sealed documents in the major resort, pointing out that it's more about the people's right in transparency. I think the key is persons would like to know what has been agreed as it relates to getting the property opened. Um, you know, if there's a benchmark, Atlantis had a most favored nation, and so uh, if they are abiding by existing contracts, then you know it, it, it cannot be any more favorable than Atlantis. Well, Atlantis's senior vice president of public relations, Ed Fields, says while resort executives await a meeting with the Minnesota administration surrounding the unsealing of the Bahamar document, Atlantis has been engaged in heavy construction and renovations of several areas and towers. Fields added that while they wait to find out if they are on level playing field with Bahamar, they will be making sure both resorts are equally as attractive. Well, we're, we're obviously engaged in renovating the Coral Towers. Um, hope to have those rooms ready in the next uh, quarter or so. Um, um, sorry, in, in very soon, actually, um, in the next couple of months. Um, we are engaging with uh, some local um, enterprises in our food and beverage offerings, um, which we're very proud of. We'll, we'll speak to that in more detail later. 
Fields added that they are striving to add authenticity to the Atlantis brand. Just last week, Fields accused the Bahama Resort of poaching their clientele. Bahama Resort executives declined to comment on those allegations, but Fields says they are working vigorously on separating the resorts. As you know, we have re reconfigured or re um, evaluated and, and, and have a different approach toward our. our, our I, we don't want to focus too, too much on talking about marketing, but as far as our 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 association and our our, our participation in the community, um, and how that pans out as um, being a, a destination that offers some authenticity. And while Bahamas' international marketing plans are not expected to be released until the end of the year, Fields says they will not sit aside and wait. I mean, we're, we're not going to just, you know, stand still. We're going to continue. We've always done that. We've, we've always moved along. Um, obviously, in the past, we spent a lot of money on new development, new construction. Well, now we're focused more on our people, on, the, on our country, uh, how we integrate uh, our resort into the overall destination, how we integrate that into um, encouraging entrepreneurship that can integrate with our offering. Uh, so, so, yeah, there's a lot being done. And we'll take a break here, but still ahead tonight. What's the future of Bahamas Junkanoo Carnival? And getting that beach body in tip-top shape? Those stories and more when our news returns. <laughs>